to start recording this. So that we'll have that taken care of. And also going to share the title screen while we wait. Then in another, in about one minute or so, I'll actually make us live so that we will. Um... Do you know how many have come in the living room? I don't know if I can see that yet. I think I actually have to start broadcasting and then people will just immediately come in. But as soon as I do that, I think we'll see the number of people who are watching. So you'll start and then introduce me. Is that what you want to do? Uh, how do you want to do it? That's a good question. Here's the best that we can, you know, you can give official title and all of that and I'll, you can Introduce me, I'll say some nice words and then. Okay. And um, what's your official title, Greg? Uh, CEO. Okay. Okay. I'm going to do it. I'm going to make us live. Let's do it. I'll give us just a minute for everybody to come on in. Welcome to the audience members who are filtering in. I'm just going to give you an extra couple of minutes to, uh, to keep on coming and then we will officially get this rolling. Okay, let's do this. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, happy Sunday. Thank you for joining us on these, this closing day of the 2020 Newport Beach Film Festival for this conversation presented by Panavision and Light Iron. I'm John Whitmer from Panavision and I will be your host for this session, Cinematography from Set to Screen. And joining us, we have two very special guests, cinematographer Don Burgess, ASC, and Light Iron senior DI colorist, Corinne Bogdanowitz. Before we jump in, I'm gonna hand things over really quickly to Greg Schwenk, the CEO of the Newport Beach Film Festival. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for coming out on a Sunday. Uh, and I wanna do a special thank you uh, to Corinne and Don for giving of their uh, time and talent today. Uh, also, thank you uh, to all of our, our friends and supporters out there, uh, the city of Newport Beach, Visit Newport Beach, uh, and our, our many, many supporters and sponsors, uh, but especially to Panavision and Light Iron uh, for being able to bring this together uh, and continue the rich tradition we have had of, of uh, making the experience of the films interactive uh, and the idea of being able to share ideas and and uh, educate the next generation of filmmakers is paramount to the Newport Beach Film Festival. And, and I want to say a couple of quick words uh, about where we're at. Um, 
you know, the festival over its 21 years has now grown into one of the largest celebrations of film in coastal Southern California. And uh, the recent crisis you know, has affected all of us across the globe, uh, but especially smaller arts nonprofits. Uh, and I just wanna say again, thank you uh, to those uh, who have stood by us during this time. And I would also ask all of you that are watching today, um, if you want to help impact the positive trajectory of the festival, please engage with us on social media. Please tell your friends and followers they've got one more day today to watch amazing film. Uh, I'm so excited uh, by the 40 plus feature films that move forward with us in a virtual setting in the nearly, nearly 40 short programs totaling uh, about 150 short films that you can still watch today uh, on our virtual platform at the Newport Beach Film Festival. And most importantly, uh, I encourage everyone to please uh, be safe, stay healthy, uh, and keep making films once it's safe to do so. Uh, and we look forward to seeing them and ultimately screening them uh, at future iterations of the Newport Beach Film Festival. So again, thank you uh, and enjoy today. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Uh, just as a quick introduction, in case any is actually necessary, um, I'll note that Don has been behind the camera for films including Forrest Gump, Contact, Spider-Man, The Book of Eli, and Aquaman, while Corinne's credits include the features Hell or High Water and Dolomite Is My Name, and the series Transparent, Mrs. Fletcher, Baskets, and The Haunting of Bly Manor. But that is not all. Together, Don and Corinne have so far collaborated on some 11 features, and other projects as well, uh, including titles like The Muppets, Flight, 42, Allied, and The Christmas Chronicles. Over the course of this conversation, we'll get to know both of them a little bit better as people, as artists, and as collaborators. One last note for those of you viewing, uh, we will have time for audience questions later on in the hour. Please feel free to start submitting your questions as soon as they come to mind. You can send them in via the Q&A button that should be on your screens. All right, now then, Don and Corinne, thank you both again so much for doing this. Uh, your first collaboration was back in 2011 on the feature, The Muppets. Do the two of you remember how it happened that you came to partner for that project? Who started? <laughs> we should have coordinated this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, almost 10 years ago, I, I, I believe you can correct me if I'm wrong, Don, but I think um, you had already been uh, working with Light Iron and the dailies process um, for that show. Um, I wasn't involved in the dailies in that one. We hadn't actually met yet until the final finishing. Um, but I think I, we just ended up working together because I was available. <laughs> and the scheduling kind of worked out. Um, I don't know if you remember anything differently, Don, but that's, that's what I remember. Well, I, I think I found out about Light Iron um, when Jim Gennard said, hey, listen, you, you should meet Michael Sione. He's doing great work with, uh, with red footage. And that's how that, my relationship started with Light Iron. Um, and, and it was true. It seemed like you guys were just doing uh, so much more and everything just happened um, a lot quicker, a lot faster. And I was getting the, the look that, that I was always wanting to get the, the camera to, you know, to perform. And um, I think, I, you know, I believe it was really Michael that put the two of us together on the Muppets. And so we started with um, some, some basic tests um, to see how our little felt friends would actually look on, on, uh, on the camera and project it on the big screen. And we had to come up with, I think, you know, really perfect color um, rendition and also just the right amount of resolution uh, to make the Muppets look uh, like we wanted them to look. And so that was the beginning. So when a DP and a colorist do begin a collaboration, do you share references? Do you talk about emotions or feelings? How is it, what, you know, what's the process like that allows the two of you to, to see the image in the same way? Um, well, for me, um, it, it's, it's, ultimately it comes down to Corinne's talent and her ability to make the product look the best it can look. And so I start off right away with just giving them, you know, little challenges basically to see what they're capable of doing and how fast they can do it. You know, it's, um, you know, you've only got X amount of time to do these DIs. And so you want somebody that's very fast and very efficient, but they also have to have a similar, I think, taste in the way you want things to look. At the end of the day, it's all about, 
I want this stuff to look good to my eye <laughs> and she wants to look good to hers. And so you meet somewhere in a place where you go, yeah, this, this person really knows what they're doing. They're fast. They've got a great eye. They make the stuff look better. Um, and so that's why we keep going back. And I think we've developed this relationship over the years and we talk less and less in every movie. In fact, the last movie we were in the same room. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of it's just about us seeing the images. I mean, I think I can fairly quickly get things into a place where Don intended them to be when he was shooting. And, you know, we do talk about emotions and sometimes setting looks for the different feelings for each scene. And, you know, we kind of set looks together, go through the whole movie and kind of talk about where each scene should be. And then from there, we can just kind of get everything roughed in very quickly so we can then start, you know, fussing over all the little things that take more time. That's right. So, you know, I like to start with an overall, um, we start here in the movie Korean and we're going to finish here. And, and these scenes from here to here need to feel like this. And then we're going this direction and the dramatic kind of following dramatic arc. So we try to use our tools, um, with, you know, the color and, and, you know, um, saturation and, and all these great tools to create an emotional response from the audience and what they're feeling. So, I try to you know, make it as simple as I can in the arc of where we're going, where we're starting and where we want to end up. And uh, then we go at it. I want to take things back a little bit further now and, and touch on sort of your origin stories to use a superhero metaphor. Don, uh, prior to your work as a main unit cinematographer, you did a good deal of second unit work, including projects like Back to the Future 2 and 3, Backdraft and Batman Returns. How did you get your start as a second unit DP? All the B movies, right? <laughs> hey, man, I love Batman Returns. <laughs> and Back to the Future 2 and 3. Well, look, you know, we all had to find our way into the movie business. And um, my way was through action and sports. Um, you know, it was, I had the ability to, you know, ski backwards and repel off mountains and scuba dive and do all these things with cameras. And so that led into the action part of making movies. Now I went to Art Center College of Design and I graduated with a film degree. So I, I learned how to make movies. And ultimately that gave me the leg up. That gave me um, the ability, I think, to, to progress through into the world of dramatic filmmaking. Um, you know, you, at a certain point, you got to make choices of where, where you want to go with your career. <clears throat> um, it's very easy to get pigeonholed as an action cinematographer. Um, and so I had to, you know, work my way through it. But the only way I could work on those really A movies, um, the big movies, was to do the second unit. So I had gotten to that point where I could, I was offered a lot of those types of movies and worked with, in essence, the A-list directors, the Tim Burton's, you know, the Bob Zemeckis's, the um, on and on and on. I got to work with, you know, Clint Eastwood and Ron Howard and uh, all these great directors. So now I was in the arena. I was in that league and they got to see my work. Um, and, the, you know, a few of them noticed that, you know, I had um, the ability to, to, to not only shoot the action, but also really cared a lot about the lighting and the way that the shots looked. And the shots had intent, you know, they were about the story. Um, and um, fortunately for me, you know, um, Zemeckis was the one that, um, you know, gave me the big break on Forrest Gump. That was the first movie that um, I shot for him as a first unit DP. So, Listen, there's a lot of luck involved, but there's a lot of, um, you know, you know, the harder I work, the luckier I get, I guess is the old saying, you know, I mean, you gotta be passionate about it. You gotta love it and you gotta, you gotta hang in there. But when you get your breaks, you gotta be ready for them. And Corinne, your father, Mitch, is a color scientist. Your sister, Jill, is also a colorist. At what point did you know that you wanted to get into this line of work? Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, I don't think I knew until I started doing it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I was probably more stubborn early on, like, I'm going to do something else. I'm you know, not going to follow that path. But, um, you know, having people, you know, supportive in your family, you know, I'm very fortunate to have one of the top color scientists in the world is my dad and an extremely talented sister colorist. And, you know, for us to be able to sit around the dinner table sometimes and talk about this very specific <laughs> industry um, really is something special. And what did your career path actually look like? What were the steps that you took that, that eventually brought you to Light Iron where you are now? Sure. Um, so I actually, well, I went to um, art school, ended up having an art degree with um, focus on computer graphics. And um, so 
after <laughs> struggling to find work in that field, um, I came out to California. My father was already working out here and my sister. And um, I started at the very bottom at a company doing uh, dust busting. <laughs> to people who aren't familiar with that is when you scan film um, digitally, there's still dirt on it from, from the actual film. So you have to go through painstakingly paint all that out. Um, so that was my job for quite some time. Um, I think I went cross-eyed more days than not. Um, and from there, I ended up going into um, compositing. I was doing more visual effects work. I was doing painting and kind of minor composites. Um, did that type of work for a few years. And then uh, I had an opportunity to be an assistant colorist. And um, the company kind of threw it at me like, do you want to give it a try? And I think they knew of my family. <laughs> and I said, uh, uh, let's try it. Let's see how it goes. Um, so I was much more involved in the technical side of things at that point, um, working really closely with our conform team and our machine room and, you know, really understanding the guts of what was happening behind the scenes. And I just ended up being in the right place at the right time. One of our colorists left the company and I was able to fill in on a feature which is the first thing I ever colored, <laughs> um, did a feature film, and um, it kind of just everything exploded from there. I was given, you know, lots of opportunities. Um, before I ended up at Light Iron, I worked at a few companies, um, some some staff, some freelance, kind of moved around a bit to kind of, you know, it's, it's a tough industry trying to kind of find your place and where you want to be. Um, but when I started with Light Iron, and um, it was actually early 2011, um, you know, I was probably only the 12th or 13th employee, I think that was there, it was still very, very small. Um, but I knew they had something special. They had a really, really smart team, really innovative, um, really doing some new stuff. And I just felt like, wow, this is really, really fun place to work and really awesome people. So that's where I've been since. <laughs> Fantastic. And I should note that it's not just Corinne's family that has sort of a, a legacy going on within this business. Don, your son, Michael, is also a cinematographer. And the, the two of you have collaborated a number of times with, with Michael as your second unit DP. At, at any point, as he was starting to express interest in, in sort of following those footsteps, did you tell him to run away or do something else or <laughs> take an, any other industry? Um, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't try to discourage him, but I did insist that he finish college before um, I would help him uh, move in that direction. Um, you know, it's, it, it's easy to be, you know, to walk on a movie set and, and, um, and kind of look at the glamorous side of it. Um, but um, it's a tremendous amount of work and there's a lot of sacrifice involved and it's, uh, it's not a real stable business uh, for you know, raising families and, and all of that. So there's a lot that, you know, you've got to really love it um, to overcome a lot of those things and, and make your, you know, your business life and your personal life work together. Um, and I'm sure he grew up in it, he experienced it as a child growing up, but you, you, don't, really, you don't really get it until, you know, the, the sunglasses part of the equation goes away and, and you realize how difficult the work really is. Um, so, you know, he slowly came along and um, eventually he just, he, as we used to say, got the bug bad, you know, I mean, he just, uh, he was living it and breathing it and, and really loved it. So he, he listened, he started carrying cases, you know, and, um, and worked his way up. And actually was a, uh, an onset colorist, which I think how ultimately he got into the into the union because I, at that time I was shooting the Book of Eli and, and uh, we were using the Red One Build 16, I believe it was, and with Panavision lenses. And we we um, you know I I wanted all of the daily work to be done um, either on set or near sets. We actually built a trailer and and hired some young, really smart people to figure out how to get these images, you know, from the raw data, you know, into a space where we could colorize it. And uh, it was a very stylized look. And I wanted everybody to see, especially the directors, the Hughes brothers, to really see what we were doing because we were pushing it pretty hard. We were crunching the blacks and blowing out the highlights. And it was really it was probably as close to black and white as I've ever shot a movie. And so it was important for everybody to see that every day, how it was going to affect the wardrobe, how it was going to affect the makeup, you know, and, and did the directing team believe in what we were doing. And so we needed it there. And so we created that and we were able to get, you know, to do the movie that way. 
And ultimately, that's how the carts were developed eventually at Light Iron. And Michael said, hey, I'm going I'm to build you some carts. You know, this is, I see what you're trying to do here. And this is fantastic. So we, we created this kind of workflow from it. You know, it was the beginning of how to make all this really work. And I said, listen, if I'm, if I'm going digital, I'm going to see this stuff right now. You know, I'm, I, I'm going to eliminate the lab and have them look at it, you know, and worry about what, what's what really happening. So let's, let's do it now. Let's do it here. So it was great. It was kind of pioneering a way to, to shoot movies and shoot them digitally. From the outside watching your work, Don, that, that pioneering spirit comes through. It, it seems like there's a, a sort of fearlessness about the way that you approach your work, whether, you know, earlier on with Forrest Gump, it was using the Libra head pretty early on. Mm -hmm. uh, digital capture with Book of Eli, like you just mentioned. Right. Uh, Terminator 3 was the first movie that you took all the way through a DI. And that's not even to mention any of the other technical hurdles that Robert Zemeckis has thrown at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, listen. And in answering that, that question is, yeah, I mean, the exciting part of it is when you get the opportunity to work with filmmakers, they're going to push you out of your comfort zone. And I believe my job is to execute the concept the best I possibly can. So as I said to Albert Hughes when I interviewed for the job, he said, would you try the red camera? Would you test it? And if you say it's not the right camera to do this, Don, we'll, do, we'll go with whatever you want to do. But would you at least agree to do that? And I said, Albert, you know what? When the wind changes directions, you can build walls or windmills. So let's build windmills and go, go tell stories and make movies. So I tested that camera extensively for the movie and we were able to make it work great. You know, I mean, we did a side-by-side -side film, digital experience in a movie theater, projected release print time, and nobody could figure out what was what. And ultimately a lot of people picked the digital material over the film material when they saw it projected on the screen, projected on film, these weren't digital projectors. These were, this had gone through the process. So that's my, you know, that's my belief to this day is, you know, we're here to tell stories and whether it's with the iPhone, you know, or, or the Panavision DXL too, you know, we, we, you make it work um, and tell the story the best you can. And hopefully these images connect with people and, you know, give them that experience that it's, um, that we love to do, which is hopefully someday go back to movie theaters. Right. Yeah, we all look forward to that day. Uh, speaking of the Panavision Millennium DXL2, you recently used it on two features, The Witches with Robert Zemeckis and The Christmas Chronicles 2 with Chris Columbus. And in both instances, you were pairing them with large format Panavision Primo 70 combination of camera and lens, the right creative choice. Yes, and by the way, I, I, I actually tested it uh, for Aquaman and did, I, I tested three different cameras and, I, and um, that was my first choice even then to shoot the movie. But Warner Brothers was just not ready to, to take a, a film that size with a camera that was in essence brand new and I not much had been shot at that point with it. So I've always kind of, um, you know, at that point, I knew that's what the way I wanted to go with the Primo 70s and the 8K red chip and the DXL, you know, two now body. And so it's, for me, it's the perfect combination of a great studio camera, a great handheld camera, um, and, um, and those lenses in that format. Um, it's, it's solid. Um, and especially when you go into movies like an Aquaman in size and scale, you need a lot of cameras, you need a lot of lenses. And um, the Primo 70s, um, you know, could, could you know, um, we could accommodate the size and scope of the movie. Now, we didn't end up using the DXL, but we did use the Primo 70s on, on Aquaman. Um, and a lots of sets of them, you know, because it was a big movie with a lot of units. Um, so that's what, that's always what's been great about Panavision is that they've always been able to service the size and scope of the movies that I've been doing, whether it's a very small independent film or all, all the way up to the Aquamans of, you know, of the world. Um, it's that, it's, it's, the trust in the lenses, it, to me, is really important. I don't want to be the reason we got to do a takeover again. Um, I don't want my department, to, I don't want to put the people that work for me, especially the focus pullers, in a position where I give them these lenses that are sketchy and they're, they're they, you know, they need a lot of maintenance and, um, you know, you get a certain look at them, it's great, but you can't guarantee it, you know, every day for this relentless work over and over and over again. And you want to make sure that the, the great performance that that director falls in love with 
it's not something we turn to them and say, you got to do it again because we didn't get it. So I need, I want that reliability because performance comes first. Mm -hmm. You'd mentioned earlier how on Christmas Chronicles 2, which the two of you just finished grading, you were, you were both in the facility at Light Iron in Hollywood, but you were each in your own grading bay uh, to maintain social distancing in, in this ongoing time. Yes. Corinne, you've done grades recently that are truly remote with people in yeah. completely different, different environments. Just in the past six months, how has post-production had to evolve to navigate through the pandemic? Um, I mean, I think, you know, honestly, it's been really challenging for six months. The first three months I was at, this is my grading suite at home. <laughs> um, I was working only from home because our facility was closed. Um, and so we had to kind of figure out a way to give people tools at home to be able to see what I'm seeing. I, of course, brought in a professional monitor at home, but we can't give that to everyone in, you know, in their houses. So we had to kind of figure out, okay, what can people view on? that's consistent, that's going to give them the quality that they're expecting to see. So we have a bunch of different options that we've been kind of playing around with. Um, iPads are at least very consistent with their color and, you know, hit a, you know, very close to the target that we're going for. So we're using those quite a bit. Um, we have set up uh, calibrated monitors in people's houses. <laughs> that has been happening as well. We did for uh, Christmas Chronicles too. Um, you know, so we've been kind of just trying to, you know, figure out for each project what the needs are for the client to be able to see things the best way. Um, it's, of course, always easiest when someone's in the room together. We're looking at the exact same thing. We know what we're seeing. It's consistent. Once you have to start having, you know, these remote reviews, you're not really sure, okay, are, are your settings right? Did you press the wrong button on the monitor? You know, we have to kind of make sure that everything's really consistent because, you know, if someone's looking at the wrong thing, that's going to throw off all of the decisions that were made. So, you know, that's kind of been the biggest challenge, I think, with this remote workflow. Um, we've had quite a, a variety of options for, um, uh, we can do live color correction sessions, um, you know, to people in their house. Um, we also have a bunch of different review platforms so people can kind of go through files on their own and then send me notes back. Um, and so we just kind of, you know, depending on the project, we just, you know, whatever everyone's comfortable is with what we do. Um, I kind of think the best way or the way I found is most people are most comfortable with is to have kind of a combination of both. You know, we can send out um, files for people to review and then also doing some sort of live correction I think is is kind of key because you know there's so much that you can gain by just having a conversation and you know I can say you want okay you want it brighter how much <laughs> and we can get to the same level while we're looking at the file otherwise if we're just sending notes back and forth it's kind of like okay I try a thing and then they say okay no farther or less or whatever and then so you end up going back and forth more often um, I think for Christmas Chronicles too I you know I don't know, Don thought <laughs> it worked out fairly well with us being in separate rooms. It was obviously a little awkward at first trying to kind of figure out, um, you know, how to explain things when you can't be in the same room. Um, but ultimately, we all just kind of made it work. Um, obviously, Light Iron's taking everything very seriously, taking our employees and customer safety very seriously. So we're trying to do the best that we can. Don, how was that experience from, from your perspective, sitting in, in a different room? Were you, were you, were you on speakerphone or just like practically, how did you actually manage to communicate? Right, through the iPad. It was, you know, we had a live conversation between um, Corinne and myself and the director uh, when he became involved. Um, and um, it worked great. I mean, listen, I was alone in a room for three weeks, which <laughs> is not why, you know, I became a director of photography. But, um, um, it, it all worked out great. I mean, we literally, I think, saw each other maybe, what, once or twice the whole time. Yeah. Wow. Got to, like, it was like a wave the in the down the hallway. <laughs> um, so Light Iron was, you know, they took it very seriously, and I, it was great the way that you know, I signed in. I went into my room, and, and so there was very, you know, little human contact um, at all. And, um, but I got to be in the room with a big screen and, you know, accurately time the movie, um, which to me is, is so important. Um, and I, you know, at least there, I know what Corinne is looking at when I'm looking at her, exactly the same thing. So 
that makes you know makes it go much faster and it went really well and so we we tend to you know the way we and i work is i'll, I'll go in and I'll, I'll look at one or two shots in each scene and i'll say okay let's do let's work on this shot and okay this is what this is where i see the scene and then we'll go through the whole movie that way and then i'll turn it over to her and she'll work on it for a while and i'll come back and we'll get it you know we'll go through it again and, and then once we kind of get the whole kind of the overall from, you know, suit the nuts dialed in, and then we'll go back and finesse and keep tweaking and keep tweaking and, you know, try to make every shot um, better and better and better. And then we're ready to, to in essence, um, you know, call in the director, in this case, Chris Columbus. Now, every director is different, okay? And Craig is in the middle between <laughs> the cinematographer and the director. Uh, not an easy spot to be in. And some directors um, don't show up. They, 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 they say, that's what I hired you to do, Don, and, they, and I do it. And some directors uh, are very hands-on. They love it. You know, they're very, that's part of they, something that they really love to do, and they get very involved. So you have to adjust to that. So, you, so I think Corinne and I, once we call a director, we feel pretty good about the way the movie looks. And so Corinne has a great ability to listen to the director and take the director's notes and make changes but never lose kind of the integrity of what we attempted to do in the first place. I don't know how you do it, Craig, but I love it. <laughs> you do a great job at that. And it's, it's really a tap dance. It's very difficult to do because there's a lot of, you know, we all have our own opinions about what this should look like. And ultimately it's the director's movie, you know, in feature filmmaking, it's the director's movie. Um, and so it's, you know, it's, you know, we have, you know, sometimes we'll have our little battles and we'll discuss things and we'll try to prove our point one way or the other. But at the end of the day, you know, we're all trying to make the movie look the best we can and make the director feel like he's very comfortable when he puts that movie out there. Because at the end of the day, he's the one that's got his big name on it. And it's all going to come down to him if it works or it doesn't work. So it's, it's, um, it's an interesting dynamic and it's difficult for the colorist being in the middle between the two of us. But, um, you know, I think the Christmas Chronicles 2 we just finished, I think we all walked away feeling great about the movie. Nice. I want to go back and talk about a, a couple of your earlier collaborations as well, starting with 2013's 42, directed by Brian Hogelin and starring the great Chadwick Boseman as Jackie Robinson. Mm -hmm. That movie transitions from this warm period look at the beginning to a cooler, somewhat more modern style by the end of the film. How early in the process were the, the two of you able to come together and start, start planning that look evolution? Um, so we, we began in pre-production, um, as I always do, I spend a lot of time with the director going over the screenplay and, and, uh, the meetings with the production designer. And, you know, in that particular movie, there's a lot of wonderful still photography of the era. And so, uh, you know, we kind of formulated a plan. I ended up using, uh, on-camera filtration quite a bit. Um, I was just looking at my notes. I used four different filters and um, diffusions also. And so, the, so the, the concept ultimately was to take it from a period uh, at the beginning of the movie where Jackie Robinson's playing in the minor leagues. And so I wanted this period feel, uh, feel to us. I used a warm pro mist filter um, and to soften it and, 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 and start in this warm place. Because ultimately at the end of the day when he finally wears the Dodger uniform the white Dodger uniform, the black man in the white uniform. I wanted it um, to be sharper, to be cleaner, to be clearer at that point. So we kind of worked from, you know, from the warm period to, to, the, to the end of the day when he's in that uniform. Um, so I went from warm pro mist to warm soft effects and then to bronze glimmer glass and then to Hollywood black magic. So it, 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 and even the diffusions, I went from, from warm bounce of you know uh, of muslin to bleach muslin to and so all the diffusions tracked with the filters i was using on the camera so in the old days it would be film stocks is the way that you would do a lot of this now i think it's you know it's cameras and testing and uh and lighting now it's all changed because of led lighting and because of digital technology however i have found that there still looks i cannot get in that world that I could get with just filtration on uh, when I was shooting film. And I've gone back in a lot of times to just trying to create it with filters on the lights and not the correction of the LED. We just had a situation in Christmas Chronicles 
where we had firelight. And um, I did it LED wise and, and didn't rely on my um, filters in a few scenes. Um, and I, and we, we, could tell you, we worked, she had to work very hard to bring it back to really get it to look like what I wanted the firelight to, to look like. Cause I it just didn't get there just the straight kind of LED and digital technology and what we could do with the DI. We just couldn't get it back ultimately to where, um, you know, I saw it as firelight. So, you know, every movie is a new adventure uh, with newer technologies and the way we do things. However, sometimes you got to go old school to get the look that you're, that you really want in these situations. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's challenging, it's fun, it keeps exciting, and it keeps it for me after doing it for so many years. You know, I still look forward to going out there and trying new ways to do things. Um, to be more efficient, um, you only have X amount of time, so you want to, you always want to have the, uh, you don't want to be turning it over before you were done because they're pressuring you because they're running out of time and they need to start shooting. You want to be ahead of that game and ahead of that curve. So you get to do your work properly. And the best way to do that is to keep testing the technologies, to keep finding ways to do the same thing faster. Corinne, from your perspective, when, when you get the footage and it was captured with filtration on the lens or with, you know, when that extra emphasis on the look was created in camera, does, does that set up the DI to be a smoother process usually? Do you feel like there, there are some things that filtration can do that, that with all of its power, the DI still can't quite match? Oh, for sure. I mean, you know, having all the filtration on set, it, it's obviously nice if the closer things are to where you want it to be final. Great. <laughs> Let's work for me. Um, no, I mean, you know, the things that you could do with filters on set, obviously, you just get a different quality. Um, sometimes we, you know, can kind of match things in the DI with some of the filtration. Sometimes you could do very different things on set that when we could do in DI. Sometimes we have different things in DI that we add that can kind of enhance certain characteristics of the filters. So, you know, it's all, again, just kind of playing around, finding that right feeling for the, for the scene or for the movie. Um, kind of going back to 42, we did, uh, I remember being very involved in the early on testing, Don was testing all the filters and we had kind of played around with the looks early on to kind of say like, okay, this is kind of what we want to do for these, this kind of progression throughout the movie. And um, I don't think we made lookup tables for Onset at that point, but I do remember his dailies colorist was very involved and is actually coming in and we exported a whole bunch of still references. Um, so that that look could actually be carried through dailies as well, because we really wanted to make sure that those looks were applied when editorial was happening, when everyone, you know, so many people get so used to seeing the movie in editorial for months and months and months and visual effects. And, you know, that process can take so long. You really want to make sure that the look is kind of in there, <laughs> you know, close. Obviously, we'll make it better at the end. We want it to, you know, of course, shine and you know, spend the extra time at the end, but you want to make sure that everyone's kind of getting used to what it's going to look like. So that was kind of important for um, several of the projects, actually, to make sure that the look was kind of somewhat established at the very beginning. Yeah, obviously, when when the cinematographer and the final colorist have that chance to collaborate during pre-production, that does help to ensure that everybody is sharing a vision through the entire you know, production process. What are, or I guess, how often does that actually happen though? Is it, is it typical to be able to work with, with a colorist during prep or more often than not, do you not actually come together until it's time for the DI? Um, I mean, I think, you know, as much as we, we try to, um, I mean, a lot of times, sometimes we don't always have to make specific looks. If it's kind of a very straightforward thing, then, you know, a lot of times we'll just provide a LUT or something that we've created that we know is going to work for a lot of footage. And, you know, a lot of times that's fine. If it's not very stylized, we don't really need to get into too much um, specific stuff. But we are usually involved in um, camera tests and lens tests, filter tests, that type of thing. We always kind of, you know, try to at least have a little get together, a look at things so Don can see things on the big screen. It's always nice just going to have a little, you know, conversation about where things are going. Mm -hmm. I think every film is different how much you need up front, uh, but every film needs, um, I think, you know, testing, testing, testing. 
You know, I mean, it answers a lot of questions and it makes a lot of people more comfortable when you start shooting the movie. Right down to the red of Santa Claus's outfit. I mean, is that the right red? Is that the red? Is that really the red? I mean, everybody's going to have an opinion about the red, you know, the red color. So those things are important to see, you know, uh, the length of the beard, the color of the beard, you know, all those things people need to see before you get started. Um, and so, but, you know, I always have a conversation about the workflow because I always want to know, and I always call Karina and say, is this, kind of, is, this, is this okay, the way we're doing this? Because I, you don't want to be inhibited down the line because it made it easier for the visual effects guys to, to get the material, right? And you just want, there's, there's certain little, platform, everybody's focused on what they do. And so I want to make sure that, that when I deliver the raw data, that I'm not inhibiting what we can do with that data at the end of the stage when we go into the DI. So that's kind of things you got to keep track of. As the technology changes on every movie, every year we're doing it a little differently. The workflows get better and better and better and better. And, um, and as we do more and more visual effects work in all these movies, the pipeline for that is, is so important. But I, a point that Corinne made um, earlier, that very, very important point is, I believe that we want those dailies to go to the editing room with our best, you know, our, our best foot forward to what we want the movie to look like. Because the, the editor and the director are going to be looking at this footage for months and everybody else. And you don't want to give them to be in shock when they come back in and see what you've done <laughs> after you've done the DI. You want everything to be close because it's embedded in there. And they kind of go, yeah, but show me what the, show me the shot from the way, from, the, from, the, you know, from what I was looking at before because I, I, I don't remember it looking this way. And then you show them the difference. And so you have to go through this process. So, it's, so you want everybody... Once again, seeing you know your best foot forward when you finish shooting the movie, and they go into the editing room with as, as close as you can make that movie look um, when you were shooting. Right, because even if you had the conversations with the director and the editor during pre-production to explain mm -hmm. this is what the final image is going to look like, right? If that's not what they're looking at throughout the process, that'll be forgotten. Right, and it happens a lot with visual effect shots because they'll go off in the cinema to the visual effects houses and they'll send they'll send back early versions of it or they'll send back, you know, because they'll, they'll get progressive as it goes and the color will shift and it will change and they'll get used to looking at that way. <laughs> and it shows up in Korean and they're going to go, whoa, 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 wait, hold on here a second. You know, let me, let's, let's, let's fix this and send it back. And now, you know, now I get just your eyes to this. Yeah. Um, and so there is, there is that thing going on in post-production. So, you know, and, and a lot of times I'm away doing another movie and, uh, you know, and I come back to the project after it's completely edited and now you go in and you, you know, you're looking at it for the first time. You may have not seen it in six months, eight months, a year, the next time you see it. Um, another movie that the two of you worked on together that involved the sort of progression through a sequence of looks was Allied, the 2016 feature by Robert Zemeckis. And w was that a similar creative approach in terms of how the two of you define those looks at the outset, you know, compared to the 42 or had, or did it require an altogether different approach and methodology? Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I was just looking back and I, I, I did, you know, type out a, a six, six looks of the film, which was the guide before I ever started shooting of what we wanted to do. So we had, we tested some things in the beginning when the wardrobe and some of the locations, and Grins established some, some saturation levels because I wanted the film to start out warmer and get very cold and be the, you know, at the point where she ends up killing herself to be the, the hottest, coldest moment in the film. And then we come out the other side. And so she created, you know, basically a look for, you know, I have it written down to 15% saturation, uh, you know, desaturation. And then eventually goes to 20% desaturation. So there, it was all broken down into groups and, and right, I have the scene numbers written down. So we worked our way through it. So we established this idea before we ever started shooting the movie of where the movie was going to go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I also have Lynn's choices in here. Lynn's has got longer and there's a lot of, you know, storytelling going on with the, with the set, but with the, just between Corinne and I, we'd established this idea before we started shooting the movie. So that's a great, great point to kick off if you can get it that far along before you start shooting. Because when you shoot the movies, you're shooting it completely out of continuity. Right, you know, you have this, this script, and you're going, you know what you're doing. But when you shoot the movie, you're going, well, we're going to shoot this scene first, and this scene goes at the end, and it's just all mixed up. So I found the best way to keep my continuity is to develop this scene. So every scene, I kind of know where I am in the arc of what's going on. 
Mm -hmm. Hopefully, when Corinne gets the material, she's like shaking her going, "Oh my God, Don, what have you done now?" Okay, well, we can fix that. <laughs> but so, so you know, we we you know through the years we've developed this you know kind of relationship where I give her the kind of the big notes, and she makes it work. And over the course of the you know roughly the decade now that the two of you have been working together, how have the the tools that are at your disposal and the DI evolved? How much more can you do now than you were able to do on the Muppets? <laughs> I'll let Corinne take that one because <laughs> big, big changes. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, don't crash okay. as much as I used to do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, obviously, I, you know, the technology's only gotten better and better. Everything's faster, better, more tools. Um, we were 2K, and, perhaps, then? We were 2K then? <laughs> yeah, I think we were probably only 2K back then. Now we're, you know, 8K down to 4K usually. <laughs> Right. That we're doing. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, everything's been getting better, faster, more tools. There's a little bit more um, visual effects type work that we end up doing in DI. Um, always beauty work or smoothing <laughs> or something. Almost every show I do, there's some sort of aspect of that in there. Um, you know, little paint outs are common in the DI now. Um, we're also kind of the last step for visual effects integration. Um, the big visual effects movies, of course, they spend lots and lots of time finishing the visual effects, but always once it gets into the DI and you get the final color on there, I mean, it changes things. It changes the way things interact. It changes the way the scenes go. So we're constantly using, um, a lot of times visual effects will give us maps. Um, so we're kind of that last step to kind of finish off all those shots as well, just to kind of make sure everything's smooth and working and, um, you know, looking the best it can. Um, yeah. yeah, I think on, on, on um, Christmas Chronicles 2, because they gave you the mats, we had a mats for so, so many shots, it really helps. Um, it, was, it was really important to Chris Columbus to really make the CG characters feel like they were really integrated in the scene. And so Corinne was able to take it and make it better in the DI room, which is something we couldn't do before to really yeah. kind of work on those edges to really make them blend better and the colors blend better. So that's, that's, you know, really um, a great tool to have now to kind of, you know, blend it all together and, and smooth those edges out and make it work. For sure. Yeah. Visual effects companies, you know, over the years have gotten much better about, you know, just automatically giving me maps for yeah, things. Yeah. I think they, they know that we're changing things and we need them. So, um, for Christmas Chronicles too, we, you know, every, we were just delivered um, 4K EXRs for everything. Um, all the maps I knew were already embedded. So, I mean, almost every shot I'd think, of, oh man, I hope I have a map for that. And I'd look and look up, yep, I do. <laughs> right. I don't think I had to ask for any. They just automatically gave them to me just because they knew like, oh, we're going to mess with it. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to open things up to some audience questions now. So just a, a reminder for everybody watching, please submit questions via the, uh, the Q&A. Um, first one we have, uh, based on the opinion of Corinne and Don, do you feel it's harder to, to find opportunities as you start if you didn't go to film school? Corinne, you want to start with that? or? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I didn't go to film school. I went to art school. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think, you know, you have to kind of just take opportunities where you can. I mean, a lot of people I know in the industry have started just at the bottom. You know, you get yourself into a company or into a production and, you know, you work hard, you work your way up, you, you know, you find opportunities when you can. Um, uh, Light Iron is actually great at taking some of our um, younger employees and kind of training everyone up. I mean, a lot of the employees that we have there have started as interns and, you know, stayed and learned. And some of them are some of our strongest employees now. It's really kind of amazing. So I think it's just about creating opportunities where you can find them and just making the best out of it, showing interest. I've had lots and lots of people at the company just come sit with me. <laughs> Just, <laughs> they just want to learn. People want to learn. And so, you know, if you show the interest and you get in there and, you know, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you can make for yourself. Yeah. You know, there's a great story um, that Bob Zemeckis told me about when he was a young film student who graduated out of USC film school, but he came from Chicago, you know, he was just a kid just fell in love with movies. And um, so he had his big meeting with George Lucas 
And um, he's like, George, George, so how do you do it? How do you become a director? And George looked at him and he said, somehow. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the bottom line, that that is truly the way it is. You know, your, your competition isn't necessarily going to be, for instance, my son graduated from USC Film School. And the guy that gave the speech was a very successful gaming entrepreneur. And he said, listen, the competition literally isn't the guy sitting next to you that you're graduating with today. It's the kid who's sitting home right now on his computer making movies. And he's going to keep making that movie until he figures out how to make the movie. And that's really the difference. It's all the tools are out there now. You, you know, when I was in film school, you, 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 you know, it was expensive to shoot. And you, had to be, you, know, you really only shot the shot you needed. And you figured out how to tie it together. Now you can shoot and shoot and shoot and edit your movies and cut them together and shoot them again and cut them together. It's, you know, it's having that passion to tell stories. And eventually you're going to figure out where your, you know, where your talent lies. Mine, mine was in photography. Mine was in the cinematography part of making movies. And, and so, you know, I was very passionate about doing that. I had nobody in the family who was in the movie business. <clears throat> it wasn't something, you know, that, but my parents supported this dream I had, this idea. I was very fortunate about that. Um, but it really is, uh, you know, it comes right down to it. You know, you really got to be passionate about it. And I think it, it's, is it necessary to go to film school? No, no. You know, I mean, did James Wan go to film school? No. I mean, he, he, you know, here's, here's a kid who came from Australia, you know, that figured out how to eventually make these low budget horror films. And he's, at, you know, and now it's at the peak of Hollywood. You know, it's that passion of making movies and figuring out how to do it. Um, and so, you know, anybody that's out there that, you know, that wants to make movies, the trick is make movies. That's how you figure out how to do it. And you do it over and over again until you get it right. Um, thank you both. Okay, here's another one. Um, let's see. Uh, Don, for you specifically, do you tend to work with the director on the storyboards and shot list from the get-go? And what would you expect from a less experienced director than uh, one who's more established, like a Bob Zemeckis? Like if you're working with a first-time director, I guess, what do you hope that they bring to the table? Right, so, so generally um, directors will work on storyboards with storyboard artists. Um, you know, occasionally I'll come in later in the process and we may redo the boards at some point, but that's really between the director or storyboard artists um, to kind of design beforehand. Um, um, you know, a, a Zemeckis is a, um, um, at one end of the, of the spectrum, so he's gonna come in with a lot of very strong visual ideas of, of how he's going to tell the story. On the other hand, uh, you know, I work with writers, um, you know, that are first or second time directors, and you know, their strength is in writing, in storytelling. But it isn't necessarily he doesn't have all those years of experience of how to execute the day, like you know, how do I, now how do we shoot the scene? And so, you know, it's it's our job to help help the guy tell the story. Right. And so what you want out of a, you know, an inexperienced director is you want the passion to tell the story and his ability to communicate the story he's trying to tell with yourself, with the production designer, with the editor. And, and, you know, most importantly, to be able to connect with the actors on a level where they, you know, feel comfortable and, and with him and, and or her in, you know, the story that they're trying to tell. Um, so, you know, you know, my job is just to bring my years of experience to the table to help, you know, execute that concept, that idea that, that he's, you know, whatever he's trying to say. And so you can help them with shots. You can help them say, okay, listen, you know, the audience is, is coming in here. And I'll, I'll sit down and go through the script with them scene by scene and, and literally just come up with a kind of simple game plan that, that so you have somewhere to start. It's like, okay, we're just finishing this scene, you know, and you probably finish what on, you know, it's, it's a very sentimental scene. You're going to finish on a close up here, perhaps, or now, we, you know, what, what's our next cut? Should we cut wide and are we out here wide in a new location and, and seeing this? Or do you want to start tight on an insert and come away from it? What in your mind do you see happening next and how you're going to connect the next step of telling the story? So you try to kind of dig that out, what's in their mind and what they're seeing, and then kind of make some kind of concrete ideas of 
what the audience needs to see. And so that's, you kind of help in that way to kind of let, you know, have them see the story visually also. One of our viewers notes, Don, that your, your experience with shooting large format goes back to, to contact where you were doing some 65 millimeter film work in there. Yes. When you are working with large format, how does that affect your creative approach? Do, how do you need to consider framing, staging, depth of field, focal length choice in a way that's different from if you're shooting 35 spherical or anamorphic? All right, big question. So Contact was a, was a huge visual effects movie. And in that era of visual effects, you still needed a larger negative to retain the image quality that you were going to have at the end of the day once you were all the way through the whole pipeline of making, you know, connecting the dots. So we decided to shoot probably a little more than half the movie in 65 millimeter, being that the scenes required all the visual effects work. Hence why I started using the Lieberhead um, to have a stabilization system because the cameras were too big and heavy, the 65 millimeter film and the Panavision cameras are very big and heavy cameras. So you couldn't, certain techniques you couldn't do with it if you were shooting 35 millimeter anamorphic, let's say. So, so that's why, you know, I, I hooked up with Nick Phillips and, and worked with him on his Lieberhead to, you know, be able to move the 65 Panaflex around effortlessly because in the film the camera gently floats a lot it's always moving and so that's once again trying to figure out how to create the best quality image and be, be able to move the camera the way the director wants to move the camera so we used 65 millimeter sometimes we used vista vision we had really neat real big stabilization imagery and uh, we shot a lot of 35 millimeter anamorphic but we also shot spherical we also shot 16 millimeter you know, so it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, I think even some super eight, to be honest with you. I think we shot them all. <laughs> I think somehow we got them all in there. Um, and so it, once again, it's kind of, it's like, this is, this is what the director is trying to say. This is what he wants to do. Now, how do we, how do we do it? You know, how do we do it? And so, of course, Bob Zemeckis being the guy that's always pushing the technology beyond what exists the day one of starting the film, <laughs> you generally have to create some new technologies to execute these ideas that he has which is challenging and fun. And it's great to get with a group of people and accomplish those things. We have a question here from a special audience member, Jill Bogdanowitz, who asks for both Don and Corinne, how do you feel about adding grain to digitally acquired images? Hey, Jill. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, don't think, I don't think we've added grain to any of your shows, Don. I, mean, I don't think we have. Yeah, I think I think the only time I added grain was in Book of Eli, so that was with some other folks. But no, yeah. we, we haven't. Did yeah, we have any Jackie Robinson me. in Forty Two? Early on, no. I don't think we added grain then. Uh, I mean, we do. You know, I do it for lots of shows. Sometimes we'll add just like a little bit, just like for a little bit of texture. Um, uh, but yeah, I don't think we've done it at any of Don's shows. I would think we most of the stuff we've left more um, more clean. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. A man grain to the next movie. <laughs> there we go. Just for has you, Jill. Been, That's some green. <laughs> Don, has it just been sort of an instinctual gut level decision on your part? Have you just, you know, sort of felt like there was no need for it? Or, or was there more of a conscious creative decision to not add grain? You know, I think that the audience becomes, um, they expect uh, things just because of the way things have changed so drastically in the mediums that they're looking at, whether it's their iPad, their iPhone, their computer, their big giant televisions in their, in their house. So I think you got a younger audience that, um, um, you know, that's become the, the, their look. In other words, you know, that's what they expect to see kind of a thing. So I think if, if I'm really trying to like be stylized in some way that if we're trying to get somewhere and a director's not feeling that I would never be opposed to like trying to add grain to try to, you know, make it feel like the footage is, was shot in a particular time period. Yeah. And, you know, again, like when we do it for shows, it's usually if it's right for the story or if it's just, 
you know, sometimes people just, you know, feel like the sharpness sometimes is too much and they just want to like soften a little bit and the grain can kind of give you that little bit of texture that can just kind of smooth things out a little bit. But, you know, again, it has to be right for the, for the project. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, do we add some bounce and some, some projector <laughs> projector work into this where, you know, you look back at movies that are projected on, on prints, you know, the image is moving all over the place. And so, so now when you see it, you go, whoa, 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 there's something wrong with the projector. You go, no, no, this is the way it always was. <laughs> you know, just, that's what we were used to. And I think when, even when I did the test on the Book of Eli, when I projected both of them up on the screen, I think what people thought was film was actually digital because it was a cleaner image than the film image. And they thought that that's, that's looking better to them. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's interpretation. Uh, Corinne, another question for you, not from your sister this time. Uh, what is the workflow of creating a LUT for a film? Um, who's the person who usually does that? If it's not you as the final colorist, are you involved in the process? And I guess as a, as a quick sort of preamble to your answer, could you also, for anybody who's watching who might not know, could you just quickly explain what a LUT actually is? Sure. Um, so lookup table is um, basically a look that you apply onto usually a log image that will um, add the contrast and color mapped in a, in a certain way. Um, and usually that's the type of look that we will give to um, dailies, for example, or you can use it in final finishing. Um, usually for my shows, um, I will create the LUT, <laughs> generally. Uh, I like to do it. Um, uh, usually the process is I have kind of some standard LUT setups for each camera, and I'll usually start with something that's kind of a standard that I know is going to work for a broad variety of uh, footage. Um, the problem with LUTs is that you, you know, you can set it up on a couple specific shots, but you have to keep in mind that this is going to be used on a big variety of footage. So you have exteriors, interiors, nighttime, daytime. So, like, so you don't want to do anything that's going to be destructive to any of those things. So, um, you know, you can add, you know, qualities to the LUT. You can have um, warmth, highlights, contrast, saturation, things that you're changing, but you have to keep in mind that you don't want to you know, get the cinematographer into um, any sort of problems while they're shooting. So uh, it is kind of a tricky process. So it's been something that I've been working on over the years. And, you know, I think everyone at Lighter has gotten really good at it. We create custom lets all the time now. Um, and the advantage to us creating them <laughs> when we're finishing is you can use them on dailies. And then when you come into final finishing, we actually have the corrections. We don't have to use it as a let. And that's a huge advantage when we're doing things like HDR we don't want to be um, pigeonholed into any one color space. For so many shows now, we're doing multiple color space finishing. Even Christmas Chronicles 2, we did a P3 uh, DCP version, which is projected. We did a uh, high dynamic range for monitors, and then it's Dolby Vision, so you have standard dynamic range for X709. So that's three different color spaces, and I can't be limited <laughs> anyway. So um, even the LUT that we gave down to use on set was one that we created for the DXL camera. And then when it comes into final finishing, I have that as a correction that now I have full flexibility to using all these different color spaces. So um, it's really a pretty cool process. And that's why we're, you know, usually insistent if we can get on, you know, involved early on and we can create that light, it puts us in a much better position for finishing. Nice. Don, another question for you. Getting back to Aquaman, which you had mentioned earlier, what was the, what was your hardest challenge in creating the look for that movie? Um, you know, the, the hardest challenge, I think, was creating the underwater look of the film. I mean, that's what we spent the most time on in the research and development of the project was, first of all, how you make, you know, you got dramatic scenes underwater. Everybody's got to talk. You know, we're not going underwater shooting these scenes. You know, we have to make it look like they live in this underwater world and yet can have conversations. So that all came down to, you know, uh, working with the stunt teams up front and, and getting them in the rigs and seeing how they could actually move around and how, you know, what kind of camera platforms we would be on to be able to all stay out of each other's way. Because um, you got a lot of people, you know, that it takes to, you know, you got people on wires, you got people on poles, you got people rotating them, people lifting them up and down. And so where's the camera go? And so then what should the camera be doing? You know, and so what platform does the camera need to be on? And so a lot of times we're on, ultimately we ended up on crane arms. So we use the Oculus head quite a bit. 
but we're always uh, keeping the camera floating. Uh, the camera was always gently moving. You know, you always wanted that flow kind of feeling of a current happening. And so, um, and, you know, having a lot of characters and set pieces um, and lack of set pieces for a lot of situations where, you, you know, you've got to work off of conceptual drawings of what's going to be there eventually. So yeah, creating the undersea world of Aquaman was challenging and took us a lot, you know, we spent a lot of time on it. Um, and and I, I think it turned out great. I love the way it looks under the water. For both of you, has there been a particular movie that inspired you either early on or maybe one that you continue to go back to as a source of inspiration? Well, for me, it's, it's Lawrence of Arabia. <laughs> That was the movie that I saw re-released at the Plitt Theater in Westwood, you know, in my 20s. And I said, oh, so this is filmmaking. This is how you do it. I mean, I was so blown away by that movie. And so um, I always go back and, and look at it. It's like a cleansing process just to see the execution of that film and how beautiful it really is. Corinne? Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have any one particular movie that's like a source of inspiration. I mean, I certainly, you know, appreciate, you know, beautiful movies. Um, obviously, it's my career over the last 15 years, I pay attention to color a lot more and, um, you know, beautifully done movies. I think uh, I certainly appreciate lots of people's work and, uh, you know, it's always fun for me to find out like what was done on set, what was done in post, you know, how it all came together. So I don't think I have any one inspiration, but I like to, you know, I certainly dabble in a, pretty big variety of uh, genres and movies and things that I take inspiration from because, um, you know, as, as a colorist, I have to work on all sorts of different types of things. So I think it's kind of fun to, you know, kind of explore all the different types of types of media. And uh, so. <laughs> we have a question from a camera assistant who's interested in becoming a colorist. Uh, Corinne, do you have any suggestions on classes or venues that they could look into or do you think that they could find a colorist to sit in with and sort of, you know, learn by looking over the shoulder? <laughs> uh, sure. Um, I think I don't have any like specific classes or things. Um, I mean, honestly, a lot of people that I know that, you know, are interested in this type of thing, there's um, Resolve, you know, is basically a free program people can play around with. Um, I think it's so important to be able to make beautiful images, but then also make beautiful images while they're moving, <laughs> which is a whole different thing. <laughs> um, because, you know, so much of color correction is about how one scene flows into another and how, you know, you, you are shaping the image and you're doing, you know, power windows and you can select certain colors, but you have to make sure that your corrections and things that you're doing are going to, you know, basically be invisible. It's kind of a trick to make them seamless. So it doesn't really look like you did it. <laughs> that's, that's always the trick. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, becoming a colorist, I think, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Dailies is a great place to start doing dailies color is, you know, I know a big step a lot of people take. Um, sitting in with finishing colors for sure, you know, starting at a post facility, you know, in any sort of job um, can kind of move you into that way. As I said earlier, kind of starting from the bottom somewhere and just showing interest is huge. I mean, I've had so many people that come through that are just like, hey, I want to I want to sit in, I want to learn. And, you know, it's always great to be somewhere that's supportive of people kind of moving up and, and learning. Nice. And we have a, a question um, about camera language and genre and sort of how the two interrelate, how, you know, the genre of the movie would inform the way that you're going to move the camera. Um, and Don, I just have to say that I, I know I'm biased on this, but I think that you are one of the all-time greats at, at moving the camera. And I've also been curious about your process and at what point it is that you start to hone in on how the camera should move for a particular story. Well, you know, let me start with the, the fact that, you know, there are probably two directors that really influenced, um, you know, my ability to move a camera. And the first one was Max Cleveland, who was a second unit stunt director. And, and so shooting all these big action sequences, he, he really taught me how to connect the camera with the character and put you right in the middle of the stunt so the audience could experience that. 
Um, and in the dramatic sense, it's Robert Zemeckis. Um, you know, he really taught me how to, how the camera can be able to become another character in the scene and how you can intimately get the audience involved in that scene so they feel like they're a part of it. Um, and, you know, it's pace and rhythm and timing is so important to, to the camera and where it is and the point of view of where you're telling your story from. Extremely important. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I remember reading uh, an article about Contact and the, the sequence when Jodie Foster is actually in the ship and Robert Zemeckis was talking about not taking the camera outside of there because there wasn't anybody standing outside of there and right. to have the camera tied to a point of view. Right. I think that's extremely important. And another sequence, and I'll, I'll throw uh, Castaway there, the plane crash in Castaway. Um, as you watch that sequence, it's absolutely terrifying. And you really feel that you were part of that plane crash. But the filmmaker never cuts outside to see the plane crash into the ocean, right? Because it's just an objective angle, nobody's point of view. So to always try to keep your audience connected to the character and be involved in that scene from that character's point of view <clears throat> and design it so it's exciting from that point. So you really feel what they are feeling. Very important storytelling. After doing both Castaway and Flight, do you ever have a hard time getting on an airplane? <laughs> I always accuse Bob of, I, I own an airline, I wouldn't let you on my plane. <laughs> <clears throat> but they are two very terrifying sequences. And Bob is a pilot in his own right, so he under, really understands that part of it. And, you know, so he, he loves to get it right. And I think he, you know, he takes that ability and it's great storytelling ability to suck you in and really make you feel a part of it. And really understands that the, the dramatic structure of, 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 of a scene and he, there's never a wasted shot in one of Bob's movies. It just moves the story forward and it grips you and it keeps you involved. We have time for one last question here, which comes from a writer director who on a budget often has to do their own coloring. When they actually do work with a colorist, they confess to having, a, uh, to, having to keep themselves in check. Uh, what creative input from a director actually is useful and what could potentially get in the way? Corinne, <laughs> obviously <laughs> a, a question for you. Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I, I, you know, all creative, you know, input is welcome. I think, um, you know, for me, it's, everyone always is, says like, how do I talk to you? What, what technical things do you need me to tell you? And I'm like, I don't need you to tell me technical things. <laughs> I know that part. I know what buttons to push. Tell me how you feel. Tell me, you know, what you're feeling about what's your gut reaction to the shots you know if you, brighter warmer you know how do you want it to feel those are all super super useful things um bringing in images talking about um references or other movies that give you inspiration or things are also really really helpful um i mean i think things that are you know less helpful is telling me like exactly <laughs> how to do it draw a shape here do this whatever you know that type of stuff everyone works so differently there may be several ways to get to, you know, the same result, or the person you're working with may know a better way to do it, or, you know, that type of thing is kind of um, usually not as helpful, but, you know, I'm always open. I'm always open to people bringing in different ideas. Sometimes I've had lots of clients come bring me ideas or, you know, ask for things that I've never thought of, and I'm like, yeah, sure, let's try it. <laughs> Why not? So, uh, you know, I think, you know, it's all, it's all helpful. It's all just, you know, you want to just keep things moving. Anything that's going to kind of slow things down, it's never good to kind of get stuck on something too long. If you find that you're not getting through something, then just move on. Get to the next scene, come back to it later, watch things in a flow, because it's also hard when you stop and you're staring at something for so long, your eyes adjust, you don't really know what you're looking at anymore. It's much, much better to just kind of keep moving, keep playing through, get to something that you're really happy with, and then you can always circle back and just make some changes later on. Nice. Well, that is our time for today. Don and Corinne, thank you both so much for participating. Thanks also to Panavision and Lightiron for sponsoring this event. Thank you to the Newport Beach Film Festival for hosting this conversation. And of course, to all of you in the audience for joining us. And as a reminder, as Greg said at the top, the festival is still going through the rest of, of today. So please stay online and enjoy some movies. Thank you all again and stay safe out there. <laughs>